I've been waiting for a year for that. Good stuff. Let's all stand and start with a word of prayer. Our precious Heavenly Father, we praise you. We thank you for this glorious day that you've given us. We just thank you for the sacrifice of your son and how he has risen today. We just pray that you'll be in this message today. Bless it. Keep us safe throughout the day in our travels and, and just uh, help us to remember you this day. We'll give you the praise. Amen. You may be seated. A couple announcements to start. Um, kids, you can have all the eggs you want. I am having donuts today. <laughs> so after church, there will be fellowship, uh, uh, individually wrapped donuts, and uh, just try and remember to keep your distance a little bit as much as you can. So, uh, uh, A couple other things. Uh, Grace House is going to have a work day next Saturday um, at Second Chance. Um, see the Silvermans if you want any more, more information. Uh, and Teen Challenge will be here next week already. So great, great uh, group of testimonies there always so and they need food pantry volunteers on the 15th for the food pantry so uh, contact Cindy if you're interested in available to do that any other announcements all right with that we will sing let's all stand On the matters of prayer and praise, all right, let's turn our hearts towards heaven. Uh, let's talk to the one that knows everything and can do anything. Precious Father in heaven, uh, it is a joy to be able to declare that he is risen. Lord, thank you that uh, you so loved the world, every one of us, 
No matter where we are at, no matter how weak, how frail, how bad, how good, you so loved the world that you gave your only begotten Son. And Lord, that whoever would believe upon him would not perish, but you would freely give the gift of eternal life. Lord, as we come to you with these prayer requests, Lord, we're thankful that you're the one that holds each person in your hands, Lord. We're thankful, Father, that you're the one who declared your love long before we were even born. And as we've heard about those that are in hospital, Lord, uh, your love for them is eternal, and it pursues them. Lord, we pray they would sense that love right now, Lord, your peace, your goodness, your mercy, your kindness. Lord, thank you, Lord, for the resurrection, Lord. May they sense the power of the resurrection in their own lives right now. For those, Lord, uh, we've heard about having cancer, Lord, uh, we don't know... uh, if they know you or not, um, but we pray, Father, that you would speak to uh, this, uh, this woman, Lord, in such a manner that she would sense the reality of the resurrection, Lord, and for her, uh, we pray that it would bring peace, comfort, joy, and Lord, we pray for healing. Lord, if that's your will, we pray for healing. Lord, for those who are struggling at the moment with unspoken requests, and Lord, there are many others, um, Lord, we pray that you would meet them where they're at with whatever they need, Lord, that they might know you more, and Lord, that they would be able to be brought through the situation that they're facing, Lord Father. Pray for healing, Lord, for Mike Simon's mom, for Helen. Lord, we pray that you would bless her in this season of her life, Lord, that she would be able to be home soon again, be with family, and Lord, that you would uh, bless her in a way that she uh, is able to express the resurrection in her own life to others, Lord. We pray for many others, Lord, that have uh, things that are going on, Lord, uh, things that have not been spoken about this morning. We pray, Father, for healing for those that are struggling with sickness right now, Lord. Uh, Many, many different forms of cancer, many different things going on. Those who are going through treatments, Lord, uh, that you would strengthen them, encourage them, give them peace, give them hope. And Lord, that you would work all things together for the good for those that are called according to your purpose because you love them. Amazing reality. Lord, we pray for everyone in this service right now and those who are watching as well. Lord, uh, online, in the parking lot, in the back room area, Lord, that you would speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Took the nails for me Living he loved me Dying he saved me Buried he carried My sins far away Rising he justified Freely forever One day he's coming Oh glorious day
trumpet will sound for his coming. One day the skies with his glories will shine. Wonderful day, my beloved one bringing. My Savior Jesus is mine. Living, he loved me. Dying, he saved me. Thank you, Arian. Our scripture today is going to be found in Matthew 27, 57 through 28, 15. Matthew 27, 57 through 28, 15. <clears throat> As evening approached, there came a rich man for, from Arimathea named Joseph, who himself had become a disciple of Jesus. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body, and Pilate ordered that it be given to him. Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and placed it in his own new tomb that he had cut out of the rock. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and, other, and the other Mary were sitting there opposite the tomb. The next day, the one after preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days I will rise again. So give, give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he has been raised from the dead. This last deception will be worse than the first. Take a guard, Pilate answered. Go make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting the guard. After the Sabbath at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning. His clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He's not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly. Tell his disciples, he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I've told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped their, his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. While the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priest everything that had happened. When the chief priest had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, you are to say, his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we, while we were asleep. If this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has been given widely, circulated among the Jews to this very day. Thanks, Mike. Thank you, guys. Uh, Russ, who does the, uh, the sound, is uh, out sick. And we have a phenomenal team who's, who's doing this, working together. I want to thank um, Aaron again. Great job. Great job. Today is... Easter Sunday. So, I would be remiss if I didn't say the following. He is risen. He is risen Amen. 
I'd like that. You'd say that with uh, real conviction. <laughs> Before we get into today's passage, which I guess we'll talk about the resurrection, let's turn our hearts again towards the Lord and, and let's pray. Father in heaven, it's an incredible thing to think about that in the eternity past, this was the day that you were thinking of. You were thinking about the cross, and you were thinking about three days later, the resurrection. Lord, uh, thank you that this day has come to pass uh, 2,000 years ago, and today we still feel the effects of that day, Lord. We feel uh, the amazing significance of the resurrection in our own lives, Lord. Uh, it split the calendar into two. It's caused nations to tremble and go to war over the years. It's caused many, many people to be set free from the bondage of slavery. Lord, thank you that you're the one that rules and reigns. And Lord, as we come to your word right now, may your resurrection life flow freely in this place, Lord, that you would speak to us, Lord, that we might be transformed in our hearts and minds. Not just that we would learn some new things, but Lord, that we would come face to face with you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Over the years, um, there have been different cultures, different places throughout the world where they have taken an interesting look at death. Now, that's quite a statement, isn't it? We're talking about the resurrection today, aren't we? You, of course, are familiar with the Egyptians who, when they buried their dead, they had this strange notion that uh, when you go into the afterlife, you also get to take everything else with you. So they would bury their dead with all their wealth. So in today's terms, if you had your F-150 tractor, uh, sorry, a Ford uh, truck and your tractor, you could have it buried with you. Or your hunting gear, your big screen TV, good stuff. Problem was, they discovered, people knew that the treasure was in there, and so the pyramids and all the fancy little constructions didn't prevent people from stealing. Over the years, that culture went away, and different cultures stopped having to do that. But come to the 17th century, the 18th century, and the 19th century, suddenly there was a problem with people robbing graves. Now, you might ask the question, why would they want to rob graves? Grave robbers were abounding everywhere, every different country. And it, partly, it was because of the medicine. As science was improving and people were getting more and more un um, understanding about how the human body works, there were more people wanting to become doctors. And so there was a great need for dead bodies. Medical students needed them to learn. And so, because it was very, very difficult to get hold of one, there was a black market that was thriving. Uh, the people that would steal into the night under cover of darkness into cemeteries when no one was looking would look for freshly dug graves and they would look to steal bodies. Now, these guys uh, who were thieves had the colloquial phrase uh, coined. Uh, these were called resurrection men. They were called the grave robbers. Now, I have a photo. Hopefully, this will, this will work. First photo that we have uh, is going to be of a device that was invented in the 1700s by a man. Here it is. Thank you very much. This is called a cemetery gun. It's a very clever invention. They decided that in order to protect the bodies of people that had just been buried, the gun would be placed on the top of the coffin, just below the surface. As the dirt was put on top of the coffin, the gun would be obscured. Now, from the base of the gun, you can see there that chain, there were trip wires, and they were spread around the exterior of the coffin so that after cover of darkness, once the dirt was on top, you couldn't see any of it. Now, this was the thing. After one of these resurrection men, one of the thieves, the grave robbers came, they couldn't tell which graves had a cemetery gun and which ones did not. And so they would dig down with their shovel, like this, looking all around, and suddenly the shovel would go down on one of those trip wires. The pressure pulling down on the wire would cause that chain to pivot the gun on a 360 ball bearing towards the pressure point, and it would fire off a round. <laughs> a lot of people died that way. <laughs> now, unfortunately, over the years, they kind of got wise to it, and they brought shielding, and they did various different things, you know, diving after pushing down, and it became less effective. So, in the year 1878, I have another photo for you. 
This is another invention. Now, this is the patent of a guy called Philip K. Clover in 1878. He invented what is lovingly called the coffin torpedo. It's a little bit more serious than a gun. I'm going to read to you uh, what he says on, on this patent in 1878. Uh, he says this. My invention, the coffin torpedo, is a means by which we shall successfully prevent the unauthorized resurrection of dead bodies. Now, it was actually pretty successful. Uh, there's a newspaper article I found um, in Canton, Ohio. It's from 1881, uh, just three years later. And it gives this uh, article about three guys who tried to rob a grave that had a torpedo concealed. Uh, it's in the Stark County Democrat. Uh, it reports that of the three guys, as they tried to dig down with their shovels, not knowing the torpedo was there under the ground, it came up, now it was supposed to discharge uh, and explode on the surface and cause people to run away. Unfortunately, it killed one man, blew the leg on the arm of another man, and when the police arrived, they arrested one and a half criminals. The problem with the torpedo was that it also destroyed the coffin completely. So it really didn't do what it was supposed to do. So in, the, in Scotland, same year, hearing about this, they came up with this incredible invention called the Mort Gauge. And in the early 19th century, this was used a lot. Now, the Mort Gauge, here we go, pretty much is just a, a really heavy cage. Scots are pretty rugged. Uh, but they still needed 15 to 20 men to pick one of these babies up. They were heavy. Heavy, heavy cages. And they would put them over the coffin, under the, over the dirt, and it would take that many men to lift one of these things up, even using a machine to get the thing started. So there's no way a, a group of resurrection men, grave robbers, could steal in the night and take one of these things. Now, it was incredibly expensive, very expensive, and only the very rich could afford one, which meant if you were poor, you had no chance. Now, we come to the fourth, and this, this, I think, is probably the most effective means by protecting a grave. 2,000 years ago, and you're going to see where I'm headed with this, somebody hired the Roman army. Can you imagine hiring an entire army to protect a grave site? Well, this is what the religious leaders, Caiaphas, the high priest, and the others, the Pharisees, this is what they did. They hired an entire Roman army to guard the tomb of a famous criminal in their estimation, Jesus Christ. So let's get into the passage. Uh, if you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 27. This is how they went about securing the tomb. It says, As evening approached, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body, and Pilate ordered that it be given to him. Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, placed it in his own new tomb that had been cut out of the rock. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance of the tomb and went away. Stop right there. This was a disciple of Jesus. Now, John and the other gospel writers give a little bit more detail about what actually happened. So I'm going to just flip over to the gospel of John. You can turn with me if you want. Um, keep your finger in Matthew 27. But in John chapter 19, verse 38, we read this. It says, After this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked that Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took the body of Jesus. Joseph of Arimathea was a secret disciple of Jesus. In other words, he didn't want anyone else to really know that he believed that Jesus was the Son of God. He didn't want anyone to know that Jesus was the Messiah. He was secretly fearing the Jews. That's what John tells us. Now, the reason he's secretly fearing the Jews is because he was a member of the Sanhedrin. That's the ruling council. If you think of the Supreme Court in our nation, think about somebody on that Supreme Court. This is who he is, Joseph of Arimathea. Now, he doesn't want the other members of the Sanhedrin knowing that he believes in Jesus because they hate Jesus. In fact, they've been doing everything they can to get rid of Jesus. And finally, they voted to have Jesus crucified. 
we read in the previous chapters that there was an illegal trial, that the Jews held Jesus, but they still had to get final permission from Pilate because Pilate represented Caesar, the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire had the final authority in all things. So that's why they go to Pilate, ask him for permission to have the tomb of Jesus guarded. Now, along with Nicodemus asking for, along with Joseph of Arimathea asking for the body, verse 39, we see that Nicodemus, and John tells us he's the same one that came to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds, and they took the body of Jesus, bound it in strips of linen with the spices, as was the custom of the Jews. Now, Joseph and Nicodemus. Nicodemus, the same one who went to Jesus, the same one that Jesus said, you must be born again if you're going to see the kingdom of God. You can't be good enough. It's not about religion. This is about a relationship, and you need to be born again. And he gives the example from uh, the Old Testament of Moses lifting up a snake in the wilderness, and he says, so the same way that the Jews that looked at that snake on the pole were healed from serpent bites, so it is spiritually speaking, as you look to Jesus and place your faith in him, so you will be healed as well spiritually. You will be saved. And Nicodemus, it appears, became a secret disciple. So along with Joseph of Amrathia, we've got two people who are members of the Sanhedrin. You could say the Supreme Court over the entire nation. And these guys secretly, fearing the rest of the Jews in the Sanhedrin, are putting their lives on the line. They're going to Pilate asking for the body. They don't want the body to be put on display along with the other criminals that Jesus was crucified with. They want to give him respect. Now, it says that they brought a hundred pounds. Now, some translations give a little bit of a, a different um, measurement. Roughly, it's roughly the same amount of spices and perfume that would anoint the body and prepare it for burial that a week earlier, Mary the sister of Lazarus, who Jesus had raised from the dead, interestingly enough, um, also spent breaking an alabaster jar and anointed the feet of Jesus, preparing him for burial, Jesus tells us. This was an incredible wealth that Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus was uh, pouring out on Jesus. They did not know what, why they were doing this, but they were about to fulfill prophecy. It says in the rest of John chapter 19, verse 42, that they laid Jesus because of the Jewish preparation day in a tomb that was nearby. Now, we already know that it's Joseph of Arimathea's tomb. It's his personal tomb. In other words, he'd already bought a grave, prepared it for himself for the eventual uh, timeline when he would pass away. He was incredibly wealthy. In fact, he was one of the wealthiest people in the nation of Israel, member of the Sanhedrin, very well-connected, very successful, along with Nicodemus, also very wealthy, uh, probably one of the two most wealthiest people in the nation at that time. And this is Joseph's personal tomb. And here is Jesus being laid in this tomb. 800 years before this event, Isaiah had prophesied it would happen. Now, it says that Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus put Jesus in his tomb because it was the day of preparation. The Sabbath is about to happen, Shabbat, the following day. And because they are members of the Sanhedrin, they don't have time to go purchase a plot of land and make a grave. And so they put him in the one that's available, Joseph's. And Isaiah said that Jesus, he said that the Messiah in the Hebrew, or in the Greek, the Christ, Jesus, the Christ, would be buried in a rich man's tomb. It says he would be crucified. It says he would die amongst the wicked, even though there was no deceit found in him. And the prophecy was fulfilled. And Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus had no idea that they were obeying and following the will of God. All right, now back to chapter 27 of Matthew. Okay, wiggle your fingers. Let's go back there. On the Sabbath itself, the Pharisees are so fearful about this man, Jesus, that not only have they succeeded in getting him killed, they decide to go a step further, just in case his claims to be resurrected after three days come true. And this is what we read. Uh, verse 63, they go to Pilate, and they say to Pilate, Sir, 
We remember that while Jesus was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days, I will rise again. Jesus had said this numerous times. He prophesied that he would rise from the dead. Verse 64, so give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body, tell the people that he has been raised from the dead, and the last deception will be worse than the first. They were pretty scared. Verse 65, Pilate wants to keep the peace. He did this at the crucifixion. He knew that Jesus was innocent, and he says, and we're told in scriptures, that even though he knew he was innocent, he didn't want a part of it. He washed his hands of the whole thing and pretended it was all the Jews' fault, even though he was to give the final permission. And here again, to keep the peace, he gives final permission. And he says this, Take a guard. Go make the tomb as secure as you know how. And so they went, made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting a guard. So they secured the tomb. They did this first with a great guard. Now, the great guard was a quaternion. Uh, we read this in Acts uh, 4.12. Uh, uh, quite likely, this was a guard of 16 Romans. We know from history that most likely this would have been groups of four. So four guards guarding the actual tomb at any given time, and they would rotate out between different four groups. So the other soldiers would be resting while the four soldiers were in front of the tomb. Now, some read this as saying it could be the temple guards because it's the Jews going to Pilate. It could be the temple guards. More than likely, though, it's the Roman guards because it's under Rome, Roman jurisdiction. This is a great guard either way. These guards had gone all around the world conquering nations. And many, most likely, some of these guards were at the crucifixion of Jesus. They would have heard the earthquake, seen the darkness go over the land, saw some crazy things happening. As you read the accounts, it says that the graves were opened. People came out of the graves alive, walking. These soldiers knew the stories. They were there. And now they're being asked to guard a tomb of the same man. They would have remembered the centurion who was over them, their commander, their leader, who said, surely this man is the son of God. Amazing things. And so they would have taken this very seriously. It was a great guard. No one can get past these guys. And there was a great stone. We've already read in verse 60 that Joseph of Arimathea had help, and they rolled the stone in front of the tomb. This was a huge stone. It wasn't something you could just get a couple of guys and try to bed, um, budget with and move it. You had to have a whole bunch of people pushing and straining and heaving, get it into place. This was a very wealthy man's tomb. It sent signals out to everyone else. This was secure. There was a great guard, a great stone, and a great seal. The soldiers, once they were in front of that stone, just to make things even more secure, they had the insignia of the Empire of Rome placed upon the stone with ribbons and wax. And they put the insignia right in front so that if anybody disturbed that seal by attempting to move the stone without authorization from Pilate, they would be punished by death, execution. That was the result. Now, the Romans themselves, those guards guarding it, they would also be executed. They knew this, and so they took their job very seriously. They could not fail in what they were about. And of course, along with this great seal, we discover great failure. Let's read Matthew 28. These guards are standing there silently and confidently, looking every bit as macho as they are, biceps flexed like this, swords at the side. No one was going to struggle with them. Suddenly, verse 2, there was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. Just like that. Like it was nothing. And then I love it. He sits on it. His feet are probably dangling. What's up, boys? What's happening next? It goes on to say this, his appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him, they shook and became like dead men. I would too. These guys are immobilized by fear. They have no idea what to do. What's an earthquake going to do against the power of God? What's a Roman guard, a seal, a great stone? What is it going to do against an angel, against the resurrection power of the Lord Jesus Christ? Nothing. A cemetery gun couldn't protect a grave. A, a coffin torpedo couldn't protect it. A mortgage or a Roman army. 
And yet, Pilate had said the words, make the tomb as secure as you know how, and they had. You know, there is nothing in this world that can make the tomb of Jesus Christ secure because he's God. People are still trying today. You probably know this. If you're in the school system, you know that people are not favorable in general to hearing about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They don't want to hear about the gospel. Just believe on Jesus and you will be saved. They don't want that. And so they devise many, many schemes. They try to make it as secure as they know how. Let's teach evolution. Let's teach that we just evolve and that we're continuing forward, progressing until we can become something better than we are. The gospel doesn't say that. The gospel says that the only way you become, can become better than you already are is by coming to Christ. He's the one that has the resurrection power. The world lies to us. They try to make it as secure as they know how. Well, let's change and redefine marriage. Let's redefine gender. Let's redefine economic policy. Let's get all hopes fixed upon a solution for viruses. Yet the resurrection is the only answer. The resurrection is the only way forward. So we come to the lie of religion. Now, this is an interesting one. See, these soldiers were like dead men. They're lying there. They're immobilized with fear. And as they get up, you can imagine the scene. They're probably all dazed, confused, shaking still. And they realize with horror, we failed. If this gets out to Pontius Pilate, we're dead. We're going to be executed. And so they talk amongst themselves. And they figure out that if they go to the religious leaders, to Caiaphas, he might be able to help them. He has influence. And so, that's exactly what they do. Verse 28, verse 11. While the women were on their way, some of the disciples, some of the women were going to see the grave. They wanted to pay their respects. Some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. And when the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money. That's an interesting response. The guards did not give away anything that they did not have to. They told it like it was. They said everything. They didn't lie. They didn't cheat. They were scared, running for their lives. And they tell these religious leaders everything. The resurrection. What are we going to do? And it doesn't say that the religious leaders went, oh, you're crazy. Were you hallucinating? You were asleep, right? They don't say that. They believe them. It's very clear that the religious leaders believe everything. They know the resurrection has happened. And so they say, after talking to the elders, what can we do about this? We can't obviously let it be known that Jesus really is the Messiah. We would lose our position completely. And they hated him so much, they devised the plan. They gave a large sum of money. They bribed the soldiers. And it goes on to say this. You are to say... His disciples came during the night and stole him away while you were asleep. If the report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circulated amongst the Jews to this very day. The irony is that there are still Jews that talk about this as if it was a reality. Yet, everywhere you go, it's very well understood that that story was not very good. It had so many holes in it, it was going to sink very quickly. If the Roman soldiers were asleep, how would they have known it was the disciples that stole the body? More importantly, these are fierce guards. How could anyone get past them while they were asleep? Rolled a huge stone like that without making any noise, gone inside, and why would they take the body slowly, take the time to unwrap the linens, place them carefully on the side, and then disappear quietly into the night? None of it made sense. In fact, so much so that all the different evidences that are available to us, we know from the accounts both in the Gospels, in the Bible, and also from secular historians, that Jesus appeared post-resurrection. After the resurrection, he appeared 12 different times to over 500 different people over a period of 40 days. It would be very difficult to cover this up. And for 25 years in the city of Jerusalem, the church started to be developed, and the church started to grow, and people were added to their numbers every single day, we read. It was actually the fastest growing time in history of the church of Jesus Christ. Everyone in that city was in the same place as the resurrection. They had access to all these people that had seen the resurrection firsthand. They had access to primary sources, not just secondary sources, and yet they became Christians. 
And these disciples continued to share the gospel, even though it cost them their lives. They wouldn't have died for a lie. And every one of them was persecuted and then executed for their faith. This is the resurrection. These men who were scared at the crucifixion, running for their lives, suddenly became warriors, courageous. That's the power of the resurrection. And Jesus is still in the business of doing that today. He rolled the stone away from the entrance of the tomb, and he wants to roll the stone away from the entrance of our tombs. If we are living in fear, even though we're Christians, of what's happening around us, if we look at the news and we look at society and we look at our health reports and we look at our finances and we look at our relationships and we go, oh, there is a tendency to be anxious, to be fearful, and yet the stone has been rolled away. Jesus wants to remove the stone of depression. He wants to remove the stone of fear and of doubt and of jealousy and anger and hatred and division. He wants to do something that is only akin to resurrection life. If you're a Christian here today, you are supernatural. You have the resurrection life of Jesus Christ inside of you, and that blows away any tomb, any guard, any cemetery gun, any coffin torpedo, any lie that's been spread throughout the world to make that tomb secure. You're not your sin, you're not your failure. Whatever you have done, it cannot secure the tomb. Jesus has come and paid the price on the cross so that you can have the stone rolled away. Now, we're going to have a time of communion. Four days before this event, Jesus was sitting in an upper room with his disciples, and he shared with them that he would die on a cross, that he would rise from the dead, that there would be power for them, that they would be given the Holy Spirit, that they would then be able to go into all the world. And they didn't understand it. And at that last supper in that upper room, Jesus institutionalized, uh, instituted, I should say, as a memorial, the Last Supper, communion. Now, it's interesting. As Jesus shared the bread and the wine with his disciples, he broke the bread, he shared the wine, and he pointed to what, what was going to happen just the following day, the crucifixion. As the disciples were looking at the bread, no doubt they were looking back towards uh, a time when they saw Jesus feed 5,000 people with just five loaves, two fish, saw him break the bread, and it multiplied throughout the, the group of people there an impossible miracle. And as they're listening to Jesus, they're probably realizing he can do the impossible. Now, most of you here have one of those little prepackaged communion cups. I think I have mine somewhere here. There we go. Thank you, uh, Mike and Beth Simon. This is a little bit more uh, uh, dramatic than this. <laughs> but if you have one of these, you'll notice there's a little wafer on the top representing the bread and the juice inside representing the blood of Christ. Uh, if you're in the parking lot and you don't have one of these, please honk your horns and someone will give you one. If you are in the back room, in the master area only, the same thing. Someone will give you one, but don't honk your horn. Just wave your hand. Or in here, the same thing. And if you're watching online, uh, please go into your kitchen. Find something you can substitute the cup and the bread with. We're going to have a quiet moment of reflection. When Jesus went to the cross, it was the full knowledge that the pain he would endure would ransom the souls of many people. He would set free the captives. He would come to proclaim the year of the Lord. And he would bring freedom to you and to me, to anyone that would accept his free gift of salvation. Now, there might be some things in your life right now, if you're a Christian, that are preventing you from experiencing the stone that's been rolled away. Now is the time just to quickly talk to him about that. Make things right. And he will cleanse you of all unrighteousness as you talk to him, as you confess those sins to him. If you're not a Christian, I would also say, please be quiet as we reflect. Think about what you've heard, what you've read, and continue to think about this. Okay, let's have a quiet time of reflection now.
At this time, uh, I'm going to ask uh, Mike Simon if you could pray for the bread. With his disciples, Jesus took the bread and broke it. I would break it if I had two hands. And he gave thanks. And he said, eat this in remembrance of me. since he made eye contact with me. Pastor Richard, <laughs> if you could pray for the blood, for the juice. Precious Lord Jesus, the uh, blood that ran down that cross came right from you. And it was shed for us. For that we give you praise. Thank you for this opportunity of remembrance. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. On the same night that Jesus gave thanks, he took the cup and he gave thanks. And he said, this is the blood of the new covenant poured out for the sins of many. Drink this in remembrance of me. As we prepare to close, there was a section of scripture that we skipped, that we missed out. If you look back at the scriptures, Matthew chapter 28, it says this in verse 5, the angel said to the women, do not be afraid for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. The women had gone, they were on their way there when the guards were leaving to find, Pilate, uh, to find uh, Caiaphas and the, and the religious, religious, religious leaders. And the women didn't know that they were about to see an empty tomb, stone rolled away, an angel. They had no idea. And as they arrived, the angel greets them. Hey, I know that you're seeking Jesus. There are many people. I have people in my family that I have people, and I was there at one point myself, who are looking for Jesus. They're not Christians, but they're curious. They want to know a little bit more about him. They want to understand what's so special about this man. I would say if you are one of those people, keep looking. There is a book you can read all about it. There are Different people you can talk to about it, but keep looking. These women had, were not yet believers in the resurrection. They didn't know Jesus had raised from the dead. They didn't even think he would rise from the dead. They would go on to pay their respects to someone that they loved dearly. They were heartbroken. And as they go there, the angel says, do not be afraid. Verse 6, he is not here. He has risen. Just as he said. Just as he said. Don't you remember? He talked about this. Jesus had many times. In fact, David, a thousand years before this event, said in Psalm 1610 and in Psalm 30, the Messiah would rise from the dead. They should have all been aware of this as good Jews, but it astounded them. Do not be afraid. Then he says this, the angel says, come and see the place where he lay. In other words, check it out for yourself. Don't just take my word at it. 
which is quite amazing. If an angel tells you something, you'd believe him, right? And yet the angel doesn't even say that. He says, forget me. There's something even more important. Come and check out the evidence. See the place where he lay. Come inside the tomb. If you're not a Christian, go to the primary source. Keep reading about what happened. Ask questions. Keep on having a look. The evidence is incredible. Now it goes on. Verse 6. Sorry, verse 8. So the woman hurried away from the tomb, afraid, yet they were filled with joy, and they ran to tell the disciples. Verse 9. Suddenly, Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and they worshipped him. Now these women are Christians. They are saved. They believed in the resurrection. They understand something has happened. They don't fully understand everything, but they recognize that Jesus is God. And they see him, and immediately they worship him. Just like that, salvation. And that's how it is for everyone. Just like that, the moment you first believe, the Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of you, and Jesus says, greetings. And you worship. And then he says this, verse 10. Do not be afraid. Back in John chapter 6, verse 20, first time Jesus says this to his disciples. They're out on a boat in the middle of the Sea of Galilee. A storm rises up, and they think they're going to drown. They're experienced fishermen, and yet they don't think they're going to make it out of this one. And there comes a figure walking on the water, Jesus. And Jesus says to them, do not be afraid. And the storm subsided, and peace filled their hearts. Whatever storm you are facing, the tomb is empty. The stone is rolled away. The storm will subside as you look to Jesus. Do not be afraid. The resurrection is real. The evidence is all there. Do not be afraid. I love this. Joshua 1.9. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. He can only be with you if he's resurrected. And he is. Isaiah 41.10. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. And I will strengthen and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Whatever the storm you're going through or will go through, he's right there with you. Finally, Psalm 23 verse 4. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil you are with me. You can walk through the valley of the shadow of death, through the darkest storm, and he is with you. Romans 8.11 says that that same power that raised Jesus from the dead is now working in you and me as Christians to quicken your bodies spiritually to enlighten your eyes and to bring you through the storms, this side of heaven, right through to the other side, and then at the end of this life, into heaven itself, where you will be with him forever, forever. So do not be afraid. He is risen. Amen? Okay. Let's pray. Father, thank you for sending your son. Thank you that we do not have to fear evil. Lord, we have the King of Kings walking right with us. We have the power of the resurrection working inside of us. And we have a future and a hope because of what you've accomplished on the cross. Lord, thank you that your death on the cross saves us. And thank you that your resurrection seals us. And Lord, we have a future and a hope of eternal life because we know you. Help each one of us to walk closely with you this week ahead and the weeks and the days and the months and years ahead. Whatever storms come along, help us to face them with you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, me. I uh, had a special request, and I do what every, any good MC would do. I said, yes, dear. <laughs> Stand with me. Grab your hymnal. Let's turn to page 216. <laughs>